Okay, thank you very much for today's great event, uh, the, the special lecture by Robert C. Merton, uh, who is the Nobel Prize winner in 1997 in the field of economic science. So I'm sorry for your inconvenience. We should have just more uh, bigger space. Anyway, so the people's main lecture, we I introduce our special guest. First of all, uh, we introduce the, the, the former president of SKKU and the head of the board of director, the junior, Dr. Jun Young Kim. Please give him a big hand. And the dean of the, the SKKU, the GSB, the Dr. Jehari is coming. Okay, to, to save our time, we uh, start the director by the no, uh, Nobel Prize winner, Robert Merton. I briefly, very briefly introduce about the, the Professor Merton. As you know, he invented the, the Black Shoulder Merton option pricing model. Some people say the Black Shoulder Mother, but it's not the Black Shoulder Mother. Black Shoulder Merton, the option pricing model, the, which is the most famous <coughs> asset pricing model in the field of finance. Uh, he uh, got the Nobel Prize in the economic science in 1997. And as you already know, he's not the, one of the most famous uh, scholar in the world. He's the single most famous and respectable professor in the field of finance and economics. Uh, welcome the Professor Martin with your uh, big hand. Hello. Well, thank you very much for having me come. Thank you for the invitation, for the lovely thing. And thank all of you for coming out today. Are all the seats filled? Oh. I'm not touching it. Uh, I'm independent. Well, I hope you can find some place comfortable because I don't mind standing, but to have you do so is a shame. So get to the topic today, if I can move this forward or let's see. I'm not very good with slides. Do you have copies of the slides? Yes. Oh, good. So then I can tell you the slides are not really for me to use. I don't use slides. This, the slides are for you if you hear something this morning that interests you to remind you what it was that you heard that interests you. So that's the role of the slide. Um, and so, but I have to get the, it's not working? Ah, well, something is. Ah. This one. Ah. This is the pointer, and that goes forward, and that goes backwards. Okay, we're set? You ready to go? Okay, so my topic this morning is on financial technology, innovation, fintech, and opportunities and challenges. I know that here at the university there's great interest in fintech, both from the technical side and from the financial side, and for its implications for society. And uh, much is probably done and talked about. Today, I'm going to talk about not the technical side, but some of the issues surrounding the implementation of fintech. And uh, before to get us all started, I have a chart up here. And this chart maps financial innovation since the 12th century. I don't say every innovation is listed. And very hard to read this. You don't need to read it. That's not its purpose. The purpose is to see, one, that innovation has been going on in finance for hundreds of years. It will continue to go on. But the other point I want you to see is the speed at which innovation is taking place. Do you see how it's getting more and more compressed? See, you start here, you've got to go 100 years, blah, 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 and then boom, 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 and now two, two, three, you barely can see, just almost together. So there's a message to you about finance techno and technology and financial innovation, 
which is that innovation is going to take place even more quickly. Something that took three years to do 10 years ago may only take a year or a year and a half. And it's going to get more and more compressed. The second thing I want to point out to you about this pic from this picture is very common practice when big projects are doing big new changes in the financial system. You're designing a new retirement system, a new payment system, some big project like that, typically involving government, but could also be large companies or institutions. The normal approach is to say, what is best practice? And then you go out and you look at best practice here and there and there and there, and you collect it all, put it on a table, and then you assemble an august team to look at all this best practice and come out with how you should design the retirement system for the future in the future here in Korea. I'm here to say to you, best practice is not good enough. It's a start, but it's nowhere near good enough. That approach to innovation doesn't work anymore and won't work. And if I could give you a little way of understanding why I say that, as I remind you that if something is best practice, it's being done. It's being practiced. And if it's being done, what does that mean? It's a legacy. It's from the past. Be doing it, it must have been built earlier, before. Now, you won't tell anybody else this. I'm just going to share with you about my life. I'm a very prudent driver of car, but I drive a bit fast. <laughs> so when I'm in my native Massachusetts driving on the turnpike, I'm driving my car a bit fast. And I'm looking in the rearview mirror to see if somebody is going to interfere with my, my driving. And so I'm driving at maybe 30 meters a second, looking at the rearview mirror. Now, that's probably not a good strategy unless what? Unless what's behind me and what's in front of me are the same. Then it works. If the road behind me and the road in front of me are identical, then it doesn't make any difference if I drive looking this way or this way. But if the road in front of me changes at 30 meters a second particularly, that's going to be not good. That's my metaphor for this picture. The one assumption that makes no sense with respect to an abstraction of complex reality is that financial innovation and the way financial services will be provided in the future is the same as the past. No change. We're seeing radical change. So first message and to keep in mind always, best practice may be a start, but it's nowhere near good enough. You have to use your knowledge of finance principles, things that have been done. So I'm not talking about experimentation here. You know they work. But they haven't been used in the ways that we want to use them now. They're new. They're not best practice because they're not being practiced in that format. That's essential in any design. The benefit of that, if you do it, is not only do you get an improved financial system, and in some cases if it's big changes, big changes, but if you do it that way, you can leapfrog all the best technology, all the best practice, and you become the leader. And on top of that, you won't have to revise the system so, so quickly. If, on the other hand, you build everything based on the past, you'll be obsolete the day you open the doors. So I just wanted to put that as background to what we're going to talk about today, if you permit me. Okay. So let's get started. Now, the digitalization of financial services, or you call fintech, you know, in real estate, there's prop tech, you know, there's all these things. We're going to stick with fintech, but the story would be very similar. 
uh, for that as well, is, in my view, offers enormous global opportunities to really improve society. If you look back at the history of the field of finance, you'll see that financial system is critical. A well-functioning financial system is critical to economic growth and development. And that the way we make the system better is through innovation. And the drivers of innovation are three things. Finance science, our understanding of how finance works, things we build models on, things we understand in making decisions. Technology, the tech of fintech, and need. If there isn't a sense of need, nothing will get done, even if you have the technology. So you need the timing of the finance science, the technology, and the need. We have need. Asia in general, the good news, you know, it's got many issues like the rest of the world. The GDP is rising. That's the good news. What's the challenge? When your GDP rises, your financial system has to become more sophisticated, more capable of providing the services needed in an expanding GDP economy. So in essence, every, basically every economy or every country here in Asia has got to redo its system. There's a need for a good reason. Things are getting better on the whole. I understand economic conditions here or in other countries, and you know sometimes they're up and down. I'm not talking about the business cycle. I'm talking long-term growth and development. Okay. Um, the excitement is that you've got the technology that when you redo the system that you have to do, you can make it so much better. And the part I like especially is. I believe that the impact of fintech, these revisions, is going to be disproportionately more important or impact more those who right now are being underserved in their financial services. I'm a teacher, but I could sit at my desk at MIT, and if I want to send money from MIT or from my office to Singapore, I just turn on my screen, I go to my bank, if I've sent it there, I, I click on a dot. Uh, they ask me one question, why are you sending the money? That's a legal requirement. <laughs> and I said, personal expense, that's pretty. And then I put in the number of Sing dollars I want to send, and boom, it goes. And my bank doesn't charge me for that. And the, the currency exchange I get when I've checked it very close to screen prices. In other words, they don't charge me a big fee for the conversion from US dollars to Singapore dollars. So for me, even as a teacher, where I am to do that sort of thing, FinTech is not going to make my life that much better. It's very fast, very low cost for me. But for people that are, let's say, working in Hong Kong and sending money home to the Philippines, it's going to make a very big difference in cost and in ease and facility. That's what I mean by I think it'll be disproportional benefits to those who are currently underserved. Okay, so I'm very enthusiastic about fintech. I think it has enormous potential and I know that it will be implemented. I have no doubt about that either. Okay. So what I want to talk to you about, though, is the path of implementation today. How is it going to evolve? And yes, it has great potential. And as I say, it will be introduced. But in this introduction and development, there are going to be major challenges to that implementation. It will not be as easy as it sometimes people assume it will be or believe it will be. And that's what I want to talk to you about. And I want to talk to you about different parts of FinTech because they will evolve and be implemented in different ways with different types of challenges. Innovation will clearly be disruptive for users, providers, advisors, and regulators. 
No question there's going to be a lot of disruption from that. The world is really changing in that regard. But with these disruptions come enormous opportunities. Challenges typically create opportunities. And so there's the two sides of it. So as I say, I want to be say I'm uh, uh, very bullish on it. And last I want to say, because I've been around a while doing this. I hate to admit how long, but it's true. I've been doing research, but also implementing research and practice for close to a half century. That's a long time. And I had the good fortune to do my work and start out just when an enormous explosion in innovation took place in finance around the world, in the 19, beginning of the 1970s into the 1980s. Okay? And what I can tell you there, first, it was precipitated by crisis big crisis in the United States, many things, shocks to the system. And the response was to innovate, innovate, innovate to deal with those crisis things, to solve the issues of the big risks that were suddenly created in currencies, equities, interest rates, inflations, etc. But that response to a crisis created technology, and I don't mean just computer technology, I mean the combination fintech, created FinTech, which has been paying dividends to societies around the world for the last more than four decades. So although they were born out of crisis, these innovations had long-term value, whether it's the creation of national mortgage markets, the creation of derivative markets that allow very efficient transfers around the world, the creation of international diversification as a norm, the institutionalization of the stock markets, etc. All of these things took place in a big wave in the 70s. And I can tell you the following thing. None of them, or almost none of them, could have been done without finance science, complex, but no more complex than needed mathematical models, could not have built the derivatives industry, could not have built the mortgage industry as we see it without those models. This couldn't be done. To use those models, you needed computers, and you needed a lot of data. So we've been using computers and data and finance science to do fintech for a long time. So in that sense, fintech isn't new. The fact that it's not new in that sense, I hope you'll take some solace, because it means we have, we've lived with this sort of thing. Now, of course, the power of the computing technology and the skill sets and so forth today are far, far beyond what we had at that time. But this has been an evolving process for decades. In the case of the 70s, they started in the United States because of that's where the crises were, but it's since spread around the world. So most of the technology and markets have been adopted here. So that's a little history for you from somebody who lived through it. And I can tell you, it's very exciting. It's exciting intellectually. And that's good if you're in a university. Puzzles are fun to solve. But it also has the feature, like universities, I like to believe, that that knowledge that you get from solving problems, from solving curious things, actually can impact society. And I can tell you, I'm looking out to the students and so forth, that's a really, really fun thing. You do something that's curious, interesting, and fun to do, and then those things actually get used, and you can see that they help people. They help society. And then you get paid for it. Now, what's wrong with that? So I want to encourage you, before I get into the details, that if this interests you, if this excites you, this is a good place to go. And I'll also remind you that finance now, and for some time, is a truly global system, a global subject. I can walk into any board, any rooms, anywhere. Well, I only speak English, so let's say it could be Hong Kong, London, New York. But if I spoke Korean, if I spoke Chinese or something, I could do it many other places. It's all the same. And the systems are integrated. We invest routinely around the world, not just as elitists, but that's what we offer in the United States to every employee in their 401k plan, diversification around the world. 
So it truly is a global field without real boundaries. No matter what people tell you, they really do get it. Now, what does that mean to you if you choose to be working in this area? Sometimes where you live, it can get a little boring. Not, not the place's fault, but you know, nothing's going on in your field. But I can assure you, somewhere in the world, things are going on. And if you're trained in finance, you can pack your bags, not permanently necessarily, but pack your bags, be sure to bring all your finance and tech tools with you, and go off to solve problems elsewhere in the world and make it happen. That's a realistic thing to do, not a dream, because of the fact that the systems are really, truly integrated. And so I just wanted to start the morning by uh, bringing this out. OK, so let's get to work now. And what do I want to talk to you about? That um, one of the questions, you've all maybe heard what I will characterize as the Silicon Valley story of what's going to happen with finance. And they say, and I'm being a little unfair, but not too. They say, if you're under 60 and you're working in finance, maybe you ought to retrain. Because eventually, between technology and AI, first the average will be getting overcome, and then the very best will be people be replaced. There'll be no role for you. Um, well, I'm going to try to show you that maybe that scenario is not the only one that might happen. And as I say, I'm very enthusiastic. So obviously, I don't believe that scenario is going to be likely the one that does happen. So why will that be? How is it that? Who will be the winners? I've said it will get implemented. Societies will benefit. As consumers, we'll all benefit. Now, there'll be winners and losers. Clearly, a very important challenge, and I put the challenge to you because it has to be solved, is technology always eliminates some types of jobs. When I used to compute option prices a long time ago, I would look up at a table the number for a function, take a calculator, and I mean a calculator, not, a, not even something that has functions, just multiply and, say, multiply and do it, write the numbers down, and come up with the answer. Today, I do it very differently. You know, I have a, something I program, someone's programmed for me on there. I do this thing, click, 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 click. I get real-time data feeds that update it all the time. And I can do remarkable things in option pricing that I couldn't do decades ago. But what I want to point out about this little vignette, I'm still doing it. I haven't been replaced. And that's the story I want to put to you. It's not about me, you understand. It's about the idea that just because you have technology that replaces many of the activities that you do now does not mean it's going to replace you. And that in some sense, I like to think of AI as better described as augmented information. It augments what you can do if you have the right training and the right mindset. If you're doing something completely mechanical, that will be replaced eventually. Anything that can be processed, you know, processing, uh, let's see if I can move this up, okay. Yeah, there we are. Um, FinTech will succeed in areas which are processing, clearing and settling, anything that's well, very well structured and repetitive. Can't beat it eventually. So if your job is solely that, that's a problem. And we have to figure out what to do with all the people who may find themselves in that situation. How do we help people to either retrain or get there? That's a big challenge. But at the same time, FinTech's going to create many, many new jobs. And you as students, you should learn principles. You should learn the foundations of finance as well as about technology. Because if you understand those, you will be able to change and adapt and take advantage of this technology rather than have it take advantage of you. So I don't say it's not something to be concerned about for society. We have to do it. But I'm also saying I don't buy the story that you're going to be replaced by Hal. 
how, if you know from 2001, the machine. Um, that's not going to happen, I don't think, in, in our thing. Okay, so FinTech will go very rapidly through those technologies that have the feature that they're mechanical, they're transparent. We all understand what transparent means. If my two hands are transparently the same, that means they're identical for the purposes that you, I care about. If they're identical, it's very simple. Choose the one which is cheaper because they're identical. And we'll talk about transparency and we're gonna talk about trust, okay? Because that's my big message to you this morning, about trust. Transparency is not create trust. Transparency is a substitute for trust. If I can transparently see the things are the same, I don't have to trust anything. And there's a lot of discussion you've heard in FinTech world about things like blockchain and so forth. You don't have to trust if you have blockchain. I'll say to you, and I hope you'll, not because I tell you, but because of what I show you this morning, I hope you'll see that that's not a valid statement. That by itself, Technology is not trusted by itself. Very powerful. But I will, in a minute or so, I will show you my reason to try to convince you that technology is not trusted. And if it's not trusted, then you either need a substitute for trust if you don't have trust. Transparency is one. The other is verification, and I'll show that to you. But if my message is, if you have something that cannot be made transparent, and very important parts of finance cannot be made transparent, it's not that they don't, they can't. And if it cannot be verified, then there's only one way that you can implement. You have to create trust. It's not a choice. That's my major message to you this morning. And if you change the, action, change the assumptions of the model, namely Silicon Valley, I think, starts from the assumption that technology is trusted. And I'm saying, well, let's alter that assumption. What does that lead to you as conclusions? So let me move forward then and talk about this. And let me first, maybe, maybe this is a good time. I don't want to have too much of a debate because we don't have much time here on whether technology is trusted. So I'm going to try my hand as fast as I can to show you what I mean by technology by itself is not trusted. You see this? This is a Samsung Galaxy Notes. <laughs> Top technology, right? Well-known technology, great, okay? And I don't know how many of you know what OK Google is, but you certainly have heard of Google, big technology, right? OK Google is a feature on here that I say, OK Google, and it says listening, and I can ask it any question, and in 12 seconds it gives me the answer, uh, a answer. <laughs> okay? So now don't worry about me. This is a hypothetical to make my point. But imagine I had a really terrible bad knee. It's been killing me. I can't walk. I'm in pain. You know? So I pick up my technology and I say, okay, Google, what should I do about my bad knee? Ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Cut it off. <laughs> do you think I will do that? I tell you, I will not do that. But maybe one of you might. Don't, don't be shy. And there's no wrong answer here. Just introspect. Suppose you were me. Would you do it? Anyone, just raise your hand. You would? For argument's sake. Well, if you want to do it for argument, I want to know if you'd really do it. <laughs> and by the way, even if you would, you're the one exception that improves the rule. And you would have to explain to me why I would do it. But if you're doing it for argument's sake, I want to avoid having an argument over it. I want to get on with my talk. So I thought this was a fast way. So let's talk after the talk. About it. Okay. But you notice that 
two things, with possibly one exception, and this is the first exception I've ever had around the world when I've used this example, <laughs> so congratulations. Um, but with one exception, nobody put their hand up. So what did you tell me? Great technology, great names, and none of you would do what it told you to do. Now let me help you understand that that was a rational decision. You, know, you don't have to reprogram your psyche to say, oh, I should have done it. No, I'll tell you why, because I want to remind you why you didn't do it. Everything is a model. There is nothing that is complete reality. Everything is a model of reality. All models are incomplete, all models can fail. But most importantly is, the advice I got from here came from a model. How do I know whose model was used? Was it the best minds in medicine specializing in bad knees? Or was it just something that somebody took off the internet? Or maybe who knows where it was? So I don't know, and neither did you, what model was used. What else don't you know? Models use data. Do you know what data was used by OK Google to give me that advice on that question? No, you don't. Could be dirty data, biased data, or maybe no data at all. Just somebody's intuition. But there's a third thing you don't know. What was the motivation of the model builder and the data provider? Was it to give me good advice for my knee or something else? Maybe it was a body parts company who's trying to cultivate supply. That will help them get a supply, that advice. It may not be good for me. I'm trying to give you three fundamental things that always occur that you have to address. I don't mean they can't be addressed. We do things all the time. But they are always there. Blockchain, I mentioned, I'm getting into that, it doesn't grow like a tomato out of the ground. It's a model, just like you have finance models. You have option pricing models, OK? They're models. And you have good models and bad models, not so good ones. How do you know which one you're getting? There's no such thing as the best model. It's the best model for the job. In option pricing, which I know something about, if you're a high-frequency option price uh, uh, market maker, you probably use the STAT-ARB model as the best model. If you're doing convertible bonds and things like that, probably the best proprietary model that a Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or somebody you know, has. Okay? And if you're doing accounting option expensing, the best model for that purpose is classic, simple black shoals that you can get for free off the internet in which you know precisely what data are being put in because auditing is, to accounting, best price is less important than reproducibility, comparability, and other things. I just quickly want to remind you, there's no such thing as the best model on conditional. It's conditional what you use the model for. That requires abstractions and assumptions. And this doesn't go away. And by this isn't just economics. This is also true in physics, chemistry, and the life sciences. Everything takes a model, and therefore, Whoever builds the model has to make judgments, what to include in the model and what to leave out of the model. Watson and Crick had a model that ended up being DNA. Linus Pauling, with two Nobel Prizes, was competing with them. Obviously, he had a different model. Okay? He made different assumptions. And that's why he concluded different, got to a different place. So you cannot avoid, in any of the sciences, the notion of what I call the art of the science, the selection of what you leave out and what you put in the model to get from the model the insights you want for the real world. And that's always going to be there. And as far as I know, I know of no AI, AI technology that does that. It can reproduce things. It can create things that create things. But I don't know that anyone would do that. But let's not get any more philosophical. I hope at least for this morning, you'll see that technology by itself is not trusted. You, you proved it. So if it's not trusted and you can't get transparency or um, verification, then somehow you have to get trust into the model. And that's where we're going now. So 
Now, some areas, let's, let's take some areas. First of all, uh, if there's transparency, as I already said to you, you don't need trust. You can see. You can see they're identical, all right? By the way, I would have that knee done if I go back to Boston, I go to my MD, she's an MD, PhD, I trust her. I go to one of the top 10 hospitals in the United States, I can walk to it. They have specialists look at me and if they say to me, Mr. Merton, if you want to be around in a year, bye bye. <laughs> I may not like that, so I'll go to the Brigham. That's, I go to Mass General, then I go to the Brigham. That's the other one of the top 10 hospitals in the United States I could also walk to. And I have them examine me, and I get the same conclusion. Guess what? I want to be around in a year. So I'll do it. So I want you to understand, I would do it under conditions. Why will I do it under the conditions I described, but I wouldn't do it when I got it from the machine? It's because I trusted my doctor, and I trusted my hospital. OK? That's why. So it's not that you won't do it. It's what you have. So, all right. So, if something's transparent, that's one way. What about something like now? Help me. How do you pronounce it? Uh, Kaka, pay. Is that how you say it here? Kaka, Kaka. I'm sorry. I apologize. In in China, it's AliPay or WeChat, and here it's Kaka Pay and Nava, Nava Pay. Okay. Payment systems. Lots of people, millions of people use them. Are they transparent? Absolutely not. You don't have a clue what's going on in any of these systems, right? You don't know what's there. You may think you know, but you certainly don't know, OK? So it's not transparent, and they can't make it transparent to you. So how do you use them? How do all these millions of people use them? Well, I try it. It works. My friend tries it. It works. He tries it. It works. She tries it. It works. We get almost instant verification. And if we do it enough times, now, that's not going to protect us for tail risk. That's central banks have to worry about. That's why we have them. But for users, hey, it works. I don't know how it works. It's not transparent, but it works. It's verified. I can do it. So a payment system you can do without necessarily having trust, OK? Because you can verify, all right? Now what I want to show you is an area, a very important area of finance, one I think you probably, some of you at least, are interested in. And certainly I know uh, the industry is very interested in. Financial advice. You've heard robos that tell you how to invest your money for retirement or how to invest your money to get somewhere. You know, robo advice, or advice. Financial advice, with one exception that I know of, cannot be made transparent. It's not that you're trying to hide it, but you can't. It's too complicated, and you just can't do it. It doesn't matter if you're a finance major. You can't make transparent. I can't look at two managers and transparently see they're identical. One exception is indexing. And the reason I can do that is indexing, there's a fixed amount you put in every, uh, in every uh, asset you invest in, and I can look at the portfolio, if it's mine, and say, is they holding what they said they were holding? Or I can create a model portfolio that exactly has those weights and see if I get the same returns. So I can verify or have transparent. Other than indexing, where there's this fixed, very specialized fixed rule, you can't make it transparent. There's judgments, there's models, there's all kinds of things in there. So it can't be transparent. What about verification? That's how we got Alipay, or that's how we got Kirka Pay to work. But what I want to show you is advice as a practical matter is not verifiable. And I'll do that very quickly, I hope, by doing the following. I'm going to pick, he's my financial advisor. He's telling me, this gentleman in the front row, is telling me how I should invest my money. I just hired him to do it. Question to you, those who are finance students, how long does he have to manage my money before I could verify with statistical significance, scientifically, not gut feel or feels good, but scientifically. The same thing, by the way, that an AI machine would do. So we're talking about what would you do if scientifically 
you wanted to come to the conclusion whether or not he's a good manager for me? Pretty straightforward question. Now, what do I mean by significant? Well, I'm going to use a t-stat of 2. That's roughly a 95% confidence level. That's a very low level in the real world. I wouldn't get hired by a Korea Investment Corp to manage money there with a t-stat of 2. And no drug would get approved from a clinical trial that had a t-stat of 2. So this is a low level, not a demanding level. How long? Well, the purpose of this science is to say the following. Let's say he has a 10-year track record, which is fairly unusual, but it wouldn't matter much if it was a 30-year track record. So he's, he's got a big, long track record. And he's got, I'll give you some numbers here. Question is, after five years, what would have to happen so that I could say, yes, I conclude he's a good manager, statistically significant, or no, I conclude he's not a good manager, time to lead. Just using my portfolio, not, no other information, because I'm not, I'm not, we're not complicating this, OK? Answer, he would have to earn me 37% a year of my portfolio for five years, or lose me 7% a year for five strip years in order to me to come up with a T-stat of two in five years. Use your common sense. Do you think it's likely he's going to make me 37% a year for the next five years? Probably not. Do you think it's likely he's going to lose me 7% a year for the, each, each year, you understand, for the next five years? Probably not. What's the conclusion? You're probably not going to have a significant answer after five years. And you can look at 10. This is not my judgment. These are mathematical statistics. These are things you're taught. These are the same formulas and models that are used by an AI machine. So the AI machine is going to tell you exactly the same answer, given the information. Now, of course, you can improve on this. I mean, there are other data you can look at. That's not, that's not the point. The point I wanted to get across to you is that investment advice is not only can't be made transparent, you can't verify it. It's not like a payment system. They're very different. And so if it's neither of those and you have to have trust, what does that tell you? OK. Trust, I remind you, requires two things. Trustworthy, that's what we usually think when we say, I trust him. OK. But there's another element, which is competency. I trust my grown children to make decisions about my life if I can't. But I wouldn't let any of my grown children near me with a scalpel to fix my knee, because they're incompetent to do it. So trust is both competency and trustworthy. Someone who loves you and cares about you can bury you as badly as a bad person if they don't know what they're doing, including with the scalpel. OK? So you need both of these to get trust. And it's an incredibly valuable asset. Why? I already alluded to it. If you're in the business of advice, it's a barrier to price competition. My doctor who I trust to do the surgery, my hospital that I trust, and they're going to charge me 100 to do the job. And I had 100, that's why I was talking to them. Along comes another doctor and another hospital. She has got a license that says she, too, is a knee surgeon, just like him. And he says, I'm a certified hospital, just like his. And they say, they'll do the job for 70, 30% off. Do you think I will do that? I won't. Why? This is a really important thing. If they do the job right, I'll be around in a year. If they don't do the job right, you understand, OK? And I don't want to be sitting around suffering what the psychologist calls regret that to save $30, $30, I ended up with a botched job. They may be great. Don't understand me. I don't know they're not. They may be wonderful. You she may be the greatest surgeon in the world. I just don't know it. But I trust them. Do you see my point? Even with a 30% discount, they won't move because you can't make yourselves transparent to me that you're identical. You try, you show me the license, but two people with the same license, you, I think, know 
it's not sufficient information to say they're perfect substitutes, <laughs> okay? And same thing with hospitals. So do you get the idea that trust is something that's a barrier to price competition? And that's quite important in FinTech, because one of the things that FinTech offers is very much lower prices. But if FinTech can't get the trust, it's not going to get people to move, or not many. You see what I'm trying to get across to you? So the other thing is, because now we're back to him, my advisor, because I trust him. If I didn't trust him, I wouldn't have given my money. Maybe I shouldn't, but I did. He wants me to do some new product or new service that he has in mind. Because I trust him, I'm likely to do it. If someone just came to me off the street and said, do you want to do this new service? I might not. So both his growth opportunities and protecting his, his job, his business, are enhanced by trust in a major way. Are there models, business models? Now look, we were all, I hope, were taught when we were growing up to be honest and be truthful and do the right thing. I try, but I confess I don't always quite do that, okay? But I'm talking about trust here as an asset, like a business asset, just like you have technology, you have trust. Question is, can you have business models that engender trust, that induce trust in people? Answer is yes. I give you one example here, fee-only independent financial advisors. It's growing like weeds in the United States, and it's gonna come, I think, probably to most parts of the world. The simple idea is that if he's fee-only independent, he's independent, he can buy any product he wants for me. He's not wed to one bank or to one country or anything. He can buy anything he wants, he's independent. Fee-only means the only one who pays him anything is me and his other clients. He takes no commissions. He gets no Rolex watch gifts or trips to the Caribbean. When he travels to a conference, he pays his own way. He does all of that to convince me that the only one giving him anything of compensation is me. He's trying to convince me at least that he's trustworthy. Why? Because if I'm the only one paying him, he'd have to be a, you know, a masochist not to do what's best for me. Whereas if he has other sources competing, like the body parts company maybe, okay, paying higher commissions, therefore, mm, even if he wants to be good, he maybe, you know, those are called conflict of interest. You can build business models to try to reduce that, to try to create trust. Now, you can all be imaginative how to do that. I'm not going to spend any more time. But you get the idea. You can actually build, design business models that help to enhance trust without having to know me for 30 years. OK? All right. So now, it, what we say is there, if technology is going to succeed, in some way, it must get the trust asset, because we saw it doesn't produce it by itself. And how it does that, well, there's many things. But uh, let me, OK. Now, the dynamic of this is the following. First, let me show you how technology could get into the system. You used to be a doctor. Now you're a tech salesman, OK? And my advisor's over there. My advisor, when he works out for me and his other clients, he uses a spreadsheet. You all know what spreadsheets are, right? He takes my data about me, and he sits there with a spreadsheet, and he works it all the way through what I, he's going to do for me, for my portfolio. That's transparent to him. He's doing the work. He sees the data. He knows the model. It's the spreadsheet. So he understands completely what he's doing. It's transparent to him. She comes along and she says, you're spending half your day doing these spreadsheets. I've got a piece of technology. Take your client's data, put it in here, and out comes the other end. All the portfolio allocations you want, bang. And if you like, they'll even send the orders in to get them transacted. So that's pretty cool. What's your problem in selling him? You've got to get him to trust this technology. It's not, certainly not transparent to him. But what could you say to him? Take all your spreadsheets for the last 10 years. 
take them all, put them in my machine, see the answer. If it gives you the same answers as you got before, or better, then by verification, you could sell him this piece. He would convince by verification, not by transparency. He went from something that was transparent to something that is not, but he was willing to do that for the safe, you know, he gets more efficiency and more accuracy and everything because he could verify. Now, if you tried to sell this to me directly, sorry, I can neither verify and it's not transparent. And as you saw, I don't trust if I can't. Okay, I don't trust this. But if you get him to do it, he uses it through verification. I get the benefit of the technology through him because I trust him. So do you see the chain? That's an alternative path for getting fintech. I know these are very simple, but there's a purpose for making them simple. I'm showing you a different path than the one where she just sells to me, directly to the public or to, to the user. I'll leave it to you to figure out whether this will work or won't work, when it will work or when it not. But that's what I want you to see, because now you have two factors of production, don't you? To get FinTech implemented, you need both the technology and you need trust, at least in this area. What did you learn in your first economics course? If you have two factors of production, labor, land, labor, capital, what are the factor shares? How much of the output goes to labor and how much goes to capital or land? That's a complicated problem, but you certainly have faced it. My question to you, if we have two factors of production now for FinTech, trust and technology, how much of the output would I pay to him and he pays to her, etc.? How much of the output from me goes to her or goes to him? Trust or technology? I remind you, technology is kind of a competitive industry, isn't it? Anybody can enter. People are always time. What did you learn about competitive industries? They earn a fair rate of return, but they tend not to earn very much away with rents. Is trust a competitive industry? I'll leave that to you. That's an assignment. But those are the questions you want to be asking if you want to try to better understand, let alone predict, the way that FinTech, which will come in, so that's going to happen, how it will come in, who will benefit, how it will come in. Will it be pizza boxes out of Silicon Valley? Will it be Google? Or will it be a global bank which buys the technology, the same technology everybody else has, and decides to charge for the moment the same prices as everybody else. So you have a global bank providing all the technological services at the same speed and everything, and at the same price for the moment. Which one will you use? I would suggest you might use the bank. Why? Because if it has the same technology and the same price, but it's also regulated by the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the Bank of Korea, it's regulated. Regulations sometimes we get a little scruffed up about, but regulations are a critical part of trust. Who would go and give their children or themselves pills if you didn't have something like an FDA or something saying these are approved as some kind of... They are certainly not transparent and you don't want to verify by taking the pills and see if you live. <laughs> That's not a good way to do it. Maybe you give them to somebody else but not yourself or your children. So I remind you that things like regulation, while they can be costly and annoying, and when you don't have them, at least for a while, you could look like you're lower cost, may be really essential to the trust factor for those elements. Also, I would point out that the banks, I won't mention which ones, have paid billions of dollars in fines. I'm not proud of that, but I'm not a bank either. So I'm not responsible for it. But what does that tell you as a consumer? That if you get the service from that bank, it's not only regulated, but if that service is a mess up, they do the wrong thing, you might be able to get your money. Because they got a lot of money to pay billions of dollars in fines. Pizza Box may not have anything. And even Google, who knows? Why do you say that? 
I just remind you, someone says Alibaba is something too big. Now, if the government guarantees it, that's a different issue. Being big is not a guarantee that they will be able to pay. AIG was the largest insurance company in the world, in the world, with a trillion dollar balance sheet. And in 2008, it was essentially failed and had to be rescued by the US government for a $20 billion margin call. $20 billion on a trillion dollar balance sheet. You'd think that's nothing. Well, it was a little nothing that caused the US have to put $185 billion into AIG to keep it from failing. So I'm not impressed if you say, oh, it's a big name, so it must be all right. Maybe, but maybe not. OK, where are we on time, by the way? I, I feel very sorry for you all standing up, but I'm, so I'm with you. I'm standing, too. Okay. <laughs> Give me a little time. Uh, how long? 30? Oh, wonderful. I won't, I'll try not to put you through that much torture. Uh, but thank you. So what am I saying to you? I'm raising a question. I'm not calling here to tell you what to do. It wouldn't do any good, because you're going to do what you figure out is the right thing to do. You're not going to do things because I told you. And by the way, I want to be very clear about that. I came here to show you some things. I'm showing you this morning. If you find something this morning that you like, use it. It's yours. You get full credit for it. And you take full responsibility for it. I don't want to hear back, oh, we did this thing because Professor Merton said we should do it. Mm-mm. I'm on record, no. I'm showing it to you, but you use it, get the credit, and take the responsibility. All right, so the question you want to hear is to talk about um, opacity and so forth. We talk about the questions to be scored, the value. And finally, I want to talk about loss of trust. I want to, you know, in a science, you always have to use data. And when you have hypotheses, you have to confront the hypotheses with data. Those are the two cardinal rules of a science, OK? So I'm going to show you some data with, for a hypothesis I'm going to give you. Those of you who are students looking for due research, <coughs> this is a hypothesis. I'm going to show you some data, but that's not testing it. You want something to test? Maybe you do it here in Korea, or maybe you do it the global. Anyway, so I'm going to show you a situation. In 2008, 2009, the big financial crisis that started in the West and then went to Europe and so forth, one thing I think everyone agrees on was trust was lost in the financial service industry, certainly by the retail. I don't think I have to prove it, but I'll just remind you, because some of you were a little younger then. Maybe you were in grade school or something. Uh, but the point is, what happened? I won't name the bank, but there's a very famously well-known bank that Warren Buffett is a big investor in, uh, which had three million bogus accounts. It took three million of its customers and created accounts they didn't know and did things with them to make money. Is that trustworthy? No. That's a violation of the trustworthy part of trust. What else do you remember if you look back? There were heads of big financial institutions senior people who didn't understand the risk in their own institution. That's incompetence. They have the power to ask for anything. If they didn't get it, that's incompetence. So both elements of trust in the private sector were badly damaged. But it didn't stop there. When you go to the financial regulatory sector, and I'm talking about my own country now, so no, no comment. You never come to a country such as Korea and tell people who live there about their country. Bad, bad idea. You know much more about your country than I'll ever know. But I can tell you about mine. Regulatory capture was a very frequent thing to say. What does regulatory capture mean? It means that the regulators were behaving not in the interest of those who they were supposed to be looking after, but had some other agenda. That's trustworthiness being lost in the regulator. What else did you hear? The regulators didn't have the tools or the training to be able to understand the things they were regulating, the risks and so forth. That's incompetence. So I just would say, I don't think that anyone would argue that it was an enormous shock to trust in financial services to a to a nine. Now, let me show you some data. If I can. Oh, two pieces of data. 
This is a survey done by the CFA Institute, very honorable, well-known in financial, for financial advice institute, done last year. And what they ask is two important areas. Why I know they're important, because they say, they list how important that each of the groups surveyed found them. And they, did, they broke it between retail investors, that's us, and institutional investors, that's uh, Korea Investment Corp, uh, SAFE, uh, the Petroleum Fund of Norway, those are institutional investors, okay? Retail investors said disclosure of fees and costs, transparency, explanation, very important, satisfaction, not good. Second, generates returns similar or better than benchmarks. That just means better, good performance. Remember we were talking about verifying whether he was a good manager. Good performance. Very important. That's not a surprise. What do you see? Not great satisfaction. On the other hand, same period, same survey time, institutional investors also thought costs and fees were important as well as returns. But look at their satisfaction. Much higher. So summary, I think institutional investors, for the most part, were OK with the services they were getting. Not that they wouldn't want improvements, but they didn't seem to have lost anything. But people with retail, have, you can see the difference in the satisfaction. Same time period, same survey. OK, now let's go one more. This is the chart. Now let me explain what this says. This looks at the net flows, net, you know, net of flows in and then net of flows out. So the net flows into index funds and ETFs. ETFs are like, they're like funds, but they trade on a market. If you don't know what they are, don't worry about them. If you do, then you know what they are. But remember I said that the one financial advice thing, which is transparent, is indexing because you can see it and you can also verify it. So it has both those, okay? It's not the lowest cost strategy. You might have heard that. It's not true. You can do, I can be an index fund. That's a pretty bold statement, but I'll make it. But for me to beat it, you have to trust me. The index fund, you don't have to trust because you can verify it. So I treat the higher cost of index funds over what I could do for you with the same kind of passive strategy as the price you're willing to pay for monitoring to substitute for trust. If you don't have trust, you pay a fee in the form of higher costs for index funds than I can do for you. But for me to do it for you, you have to trust me. Do you see the point? So index funds make sense for that purpose. But they do have the feature, they don't require trust. Vanguard is a great company, has wonderful reputation. But you don't have to trust Vanguard. Your money is with a custodian. Vanguard can't run off with your money. And Vanguard, to the extent you're getting indexing from them, you can monitor them and you can verify. So you don't need to trust them. I don't mean that they're not trustworthy, you just don't need to, okay? So here's my interpretation. What do I see? From the time of the crisis, all the way up till now, if you extend it, 10 years, over 10 years since the crisis, and during this period, in most places in the world, I know things in markets do this, it's been a bull market since the crisis. If you just look at almost every stock index, is up considerably. So whatever shocks people's behavior or something, we've had 10 years of bull market. And what you see here is a steady trend of what? Indexing and ETFs going up. What's this? This is actively managed mutual funds. What does actively mean? Not indexed. They're using models. They're using judgment. They're using something. They're opaque from this morning's lesson. They can't be made transparent. These are transparent. These are not. Neither of them are verifiable. Well, this is verifiable as to what it says it does. 
This one, you can't verify. We've been through that. Remember the exercise. So you see about, this is just the US, and it's only mutual funds and ETFs. Why? Because that's what retail people buy, us. Institutions don't buy mutual funds. They have managed accounts and so forth, OK? So this is looking at what retail has done in this period, this period when they're dissatisfied. We saw that, OK? Way shifting into it and out of actives. About a trillion dollars in net and about a trillion dollars out of the other. Two trillion dollars swing, one US. That's a big number. OK? Now, the question is, we see the data. What is your hypothesis as to why we observe this? I'll help you a little. The little help I'm going to give you is the following. Let's go back to this date, the beginning of this. At that time, there were retail investors who didn't believe active money could beat indexing. You've all been taught that that's a possibility in class, or you've read about it, or even been involved in it. They believe, therefore, that indexing is the right answer because they don't believe active money can beat the market. What are they invested in for their risk assets? Index funds. OK? So they're already indexed there. Then there are a bunch of others who believe that active money, people using models and doing, can beat indexing. They can earn higher returns for risk. And they put their money with them. That's an equilibrium. I don't know how many were in each, but that's an equilibrium. What we have to explain with our hypothesis is how the equilibrium changed so that we have a trillion dollars one way and a trillion dollars the other way. Two trillion dollar swing. Net, just about zero of the two groups. So it's not money flew out of the fund industries or particularly in, OK? Well, it could be that everybody who was active, you know, who believed that active, woke up one day and said, oh my god, I don't believe that they can beat indexing. That's possible, but there's no events that you can point to that would trigger that. Active money did no worse than passive money during the crisis when markets all fell by 40 or 50 percent. So it's not like one outperformed the other in some major way. So that's going to be a tough hypothesis if that's what you think happened. Someone will say, well, they found out that the cost of indexing, the fees anyway, were lower than for active. Well, people have known that for 40 years. Vanguard, among others, says that every day in all its ads to remind you. So there was no shock that suddenly you found out that fees were higher. So what caused it? Well, we do know, or at least your heads went like this enough, so I'm going to say we do know. The trust was really shocked, particularly in the retail sector, with the crisis. Suppose, as a result of that shock, a loss of trust, retail investors who used to invest in active funds because they had to trust, they had to trust them, like no longer trusted. So they can't use them anymore. Just as if he's my advisor, I trust him. If I stop trusting him, he's not going to be my advisor anymore. I can't use him. I don't have a choice. But you still have to invest, right? The fact that you've lost trust in the active investors doesn't mean, well, I do nothing. You've got to invest your money. So what do you invest your money in? The hypothesis I have is the next best thing that doesn't take trust, indexing. Warren Buffett has said if his widow invested in index funds, she'd be OK. So it's a good strategy. It's a not an easy strategy to beat. There's trillions of dollars in it around the world, very sensibly. OK? And so if you don't have to trust, that's where you can go. It may be your second best. If you could trust, you already showed you would be with the, but you've lost the trust. If my hypothesis is correct, which it may not be. That's what you have to figure out. How would you create tests to test my hypothesis? I've given you some data to give you thoughts. Can you find clever ways to test the hypothesis to see whether there's strong enough evidence 
I've done it for the United States. I have no idea what it would be here in Korea, and it may be quite a different story, okay? But maybe you can test it. But if my hypothesis is correct, what does it tell you? The loss of trust have a profound effect on investment behavior, particularly among us, retail. Profound effect. Big. Transformational. Now, you might say that's a pretty big cost to the industry. I don't know whether, but probably a cost to people because they chose these if they could only trust. The loss of trust is what I argue is why they went here. Second best choice. So there's loss. So that's the bad news. What's the good news? If you all can be very clever and working with regulators and they can be very clever and we do all the transformations to our financial system while we're doing fintech, remember we have to make all these big changes, you're all aware of them, I don't have to tell you what's going on, payment systems, everything, including advice on investing, remember how we got him to use technology. So this is a big transformation, you're gonna do it and the regulators are gonna to have to deal with all these new situations, they are different. But if we do it right, then maybe we can restore trust or even improve for where it was in 2007. In that case, we not only can reverse this, we can improve on it. So I thought I'd show you some data to suggest to you something about the magnitude of trust, that this is not a small matter, that this isn't nice or round off, that it's a first order effect. And it may well give you a quite different path of development of the whole industry as fintech becomes a part of all of our societies, we hope to the better. So I think probably, unless I've got something else to show you, and I don't think I do. Well, I've got a few observations here, but I think you can read those. Let's see if there's any one that I want to call attention to before I shut down. Um, the obvious one is the following. The advisor and me are on the same side of the table. We're not in conflict. He's not, you know, we're kind of... I want him to be my advisor for the rest of my life. Why? Because that means, one, I trust him and I'm getting good services. Two, I don't have to go and find another advisor. It's a lot of work to find a good advisor, just like it's a lot of work to find a new dentist or a new doctor. <laughs> it's a lot of work. So if I can keep him, I'm happy as can be. And of course, since he's in business, he would be very happy to keep me. So in effect, we both want to stay married. That's good. We're on the same side of the table. The problem is that we may not stay married, among other things, if trust is lost, either because of competency or trustworthiness or both. So it's, it, I want to remind you, it's not a conflict situation. The next thing I would just say to you a little bit, because this might be of interest to you in thinking about it, uh, two things about crisis. Well, that's too complicated. Let me just say something about what I would call the triangle between you, the customer. I don't have a blackboard, so you'll, I'm doing it in the air. You're a little dot up here. You're the customer. Over here is the regulator, and over here is the provider. Customer, regulator, provider. Triangle, right? We need trust between the customer and the provider, whether it's the advisor or whomever I'm getting it from. Okay? We need trust there. If we do, then we can work well. Where else do we need trust? We also have to, you have to trust that the regulator's doing the job. Again, go back to medicine. If you started getting worried that the regulators that test drugs to see if they're safe are not doing their job, I think we'd be pretty shocked, right? A lot of people, not in this country, I don't think, but I know in other countries in Asia, when that's come up, people take their children and they fly to a different country to get treatment because they don't trust, okay? So trust is required for you and I with both the regulator and the provider. But the part I want to show you is the leg between the provider and the regulator. Too often, particularly in these 
challenging times, it's looked like it's a conflict. The regulators on this side protecting us and the bad providers on the other side trying to see how they can do us in. Are there bad people in providers, both incompetent or dishonest or non trust Absolutely. Same for people in the clergy and same for people in academia. There are fools and knaves everywhere. So let's all agree we don't want fools or knaves having anything to do with decisions for anybody. Let's agree on that. But for most profession, people in a profession, they are neither fools or knaves. They have skills, and they're not, they want to do a good job, good job for them. They want to make a living. They want to make good living, but I think they do. So where, if we can get trust between the provider and the regulator, that will improve things immensely. Why? Regulators have a tough job. Remember, they have to write the rules, but who knows more about the businesses that they're regulating? It's the people that do it. If you're, you know, if you're banks or anything, the people there know more about it than the regulators know about it. It's not the regulator's fault. That's what they do, and there's a lot of them. So the regulator could benefit if they could trust the provider to help them to have a dialogue, a same side of the table. You, regulator, me, provider, we both want our customers, the public, to be better off, to have good retirements, to have good outcomes. It's good for his business, and it's good for, that's what the regulator is supposed to help do. So I'm reminding you, in that sense, the regulator and the provider are on the same side of the table. Again, there are bad people. That's why we have policemen. But not everybody is a crook. And what we have to think about is all the people who are not crooks getting the trust between the provider and the regulator so that they can work together and more efficiently design good regulation, effective regulation that enhances trust and delivery, and avoids bad regulation, costly regulation, misguided even if well-meant regulation. So that's where trust comes in there. I think on that, you can read the rest of these things. I don't think you need me to repeat them to you. Thank you very much for standing there. Thank you all standing up there. My goodness. It's warm, and you've been standing all this time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you all, and I'm done. Now, now we have uh, just the Q&A session. But before the Q&A session, I should announce, I should uh, introduce the, our joint organizer, Demander. The Professor Martin Walcott currently works at the Demander Founder Advisor, the world-class founder buying company. He, start, he, he teaches the, the finance in the Sloan Business School of MIT, and he also works at the, as a regional scientist in the Demander Founder Advisor. That's why he maintained the balanced uh, view between the academician and market practitioner. And now is the, the short the Q&A session. Any questions from the floor? I'll now to Mr. Ann. That's a question. First question. Now there is many Korean use Samsung Pay, which is uh, kind of the fintech in Korea. Thank you. But we use almost the only the fintech as a payment method. What do you think of the fintech would be like in the near future? I wonder more specific if an expensive shape of the fintech in our life. Uh, second question. I prepare for the CPA's examination, so financial measurement is inevitable like Thanos. When I faced the black shoes murder model, I felt it is logical, rational, and even beautiful. And you said you're a fast driver and the value of trust is an important thing. So how do you think about the black shoes murder model's effectiveness in the terms of reality explanation power compared with time it was developed? Okay, I think I understood the question. Not your fault, my ears. Uh, but I'll do my best. And if I do it wrong, say no, that's not what I meant. I think I heard the last couple of sentences. And that is, you asked about the option pricing, the Black Scholes model. I named it the Black Scholes model. Somebody put my name on it later. Okay. <laughs> Be kind of cheeky, as the Brits would say, to put your own name on a model. But anyway, um, is that what you were asking about the Black-Scholes model, or do you ask him more? I mean, I, I'm, I want to respond, but maybe someone can help. Do you, do you trust the Black-Scholes model's power? 
Yeah, the power. OK. First of all, let me tell you what I think is important about the, uh, that model, other than I had something to do with it. And that is two things. First, it came right at the right time, where there was, remember I mentioned to you early, need. We had all this innovation, including creating an options market. We just happened to do the work at the right time. And lo and behold, because there was no data. There were no data. Yes, there were over-the-counter options, but they weren't markets because they weren't two-sided. Nobody had any experience, let alone real models. And now they want to create an, a, a, a traded insurance market for options. You know, that's an insurance market. So they had to have a model. They had to have a way to do it where you're trading, you know, not just sitting around doing it, OK? So it turned out this model had two features that made it get used almost immediately around the world. Was, one, the foundation of the model made sense. I mean, it was when you looked at it and saw the basis of the de development, it wasn't ad hoc. You know, I think it's a cube root rule. You know, that seemed good to me, you know, sort of up in the air. It was all derived pretty carefully from pretty good first principles. The second thing that made it very valuable was the information it needed to be used. And what was most important is the information it didn't need to be used. If you've ever used the Black-Scholes model, and it's a simple version, but you know what the data are that you have to put in to use it, there's really only one non-observable, and that's the volatility. But that can be estimated, and estimated reasonably well. What is missing, which is totally counterintuitive, the expected return on the underlying security, which the options on puts or calls. So she could be thinking that a stock has an expected return of 15%, and he can think the same stock has an expected return of minus 15%. He's a bear, she's a bull, and guess what? If they agree on the volatility, which you could observe without knowing the mean, they'll agree on the option price. Counterintuitive, we're not going into why, but that's the fact. That made it very practical, because the thing that you cannot measure well, remember we talked about verification? I showed you how many years to find out. That's all about estimating the mean, the average return or the expected return. It takes years and years and years. The beauty is that model didn't need it. And that's been the basis of the whole derivatives industry for the last 45 years. You can be in the derivatives business and have no judgment as to whether the underlying asset has a high expected return or a low one. Even though they vastly disagree on the mean and can disagree for a long time because we saw it takes years and years to test the hypothesis of which of the two of you is right. I showed you that already. So that's what made it very practical. The second thing that made it very practical was my part of the contribution. My piece of the contribution was I showed that there was, in theory, or steering, that you could trade dynamically the underlying asset and the risk-free asset according to a set of trading rules, which I would prescribe from the formulas. And if you traded it perfectly, made no mistakes, etc., you know, it's ideally, you could create, synthesize any derivative you want, not just options, any derivative. When I say synthesize, you can manufacture it. If it didn't exist, I can create it, just like you have an assembly line that creates a car. I can create any derivative, and I give you the technology which tells you how to trade it to produce the outcome and what inputs you need to do that. That created a production theory for financial products, for financial derivatives. Because everything, bonds, corporate bonds, everything, they're all derivatives. They all derive their value from the assets of the, that are pledged to them. So that's the reasons that I think that's done. Now, what has happened is the, we did not get the prize for the Black-Scholes formula. The Black-Scholes formula is a very special case of what I just described. We make some very specific assumptions. They, everybody likes a formula. When we got the prize, they said, finally, an economist, it looks like a physics again. There's a formula. But the reality was we didn't get it for the formula. We got it for the methodology because the methodology is far more general. And we've gone long, long away 
from using the simple model, except for things like option expensing. I mentioned in some cases. They're much more sophisticated models, but to this day, the methodology is the same. It's about you dream up how to price some derivative you never saw. In my class, I, if you were in my class today, and we were going to do it, I'd say, what's a squiggle? Anybody know what a squiggle is? I don't either. <laughs> we're going to design a security. And what we would do is we'd do it by, by, by <coughs> committee. We'll use each one of you to give a different payoff for different states. So I say, if the underlying stock is 32 in three years, what your payment is? And you draw some crazy looking graph. It could be anything. That's a squiggle. It defines it. Now I say, all right, we know what a squiggle is. How would we figure out its production cost? Not what we could sell it for. What we could sell it for Well, it depends on what people want to buy it. Well, what could we produce it for? The technology will allow us to do that. So we know our production cost. What's the production process? Physically, how will we generate this? It gives us a, a rules for how to trade underneath to manufacture this. So it's a production theory. That's still the way it's done, and that's what's driven this industry. And it's also allowed regulatorily, as well as risk committees, to much more rapidly put innovations of things you've never seen before. The squiggle had never been seen before. But if the technology and the reasoning that produces both the production cost and the risk characteristics has been used for years and years and years, both the risk committee of the bank or whatever institution, and the regulator will let you produce and sell squiggles even though they've never seen a squiggle. Instead of saying, well, all right, you can produce a little bit of squiggle for five or 10 years until we get enough experience to know it's OK. So I, I'm trying to give an answer to the question useful. So there's been huge improvements. Improvements also driven by data, better models, all the things, you know. My goodness, if we hadn't had improvements in 45 years, it's not a good sign. But what is there is that's still the way that the underlying methodology of how the whole business is done. So I hope that answers the question for you. If it doesn't, I'm sorry, I answered the wrong question. <laughs> I bet you some of you have done that on an exam, right? You got asked a question, you didn't know the answer, and then you put in the other. Yes, over here, which? Have your, uh, thank you very much for a great lecture. Um, I'm actually a, a big fan of your 1987 paper as well about uh, investor recognition hypothesis kind of things. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you are working for DFA, and they want to ask you about you know uh, what uh, over time, how uh, how much of a fintech were I mean what kind of fintech was adopted in DFA in, uh, as you observe. And then, for example, traders or analysts working there, how much, what kind of technologies do they use, and what do you foresee uh, is going to happen in the future? Right. OK. Um, well, I can answer you for DFA. I haven't always been a part of DFA. It was founded 38 years ago by a person named David Booth. You might have heard of the Booth School of Business at Chicago. Um, but. I know about it a long time. I was an independent director of the funds for many years before I went into business with them. So I do know enough about them. Uh, the firm was founded completely on finance science. They were a couple of graduate students you know, who decided not to go on for their PhDs and went into business. And they used some stuff out of the science to create a, an investment strategy to complete markets. It was the idea that small cap stocks were worth doing, and they were not being included, say, in indexing. Okay, So it was based on science, and it's been based on science ever since. So based on science is two things. One, it uses scientific principles. Two, in evaluating its products and what it does, it requires the same kind of uh, scientific rigor. You have hypothesis. It's going to be a good product. It's going to sell well. But then you have to confront it with the data. And the data have to be good enough so that uh, people like Gene Farmer and Ken French, those are names you might, and, and the directors say, good enough, go ahead. So there's two purposes to scientific method. One is the science to get the ideas and how to do it. And the other is, as a business process, what do you go through to decide whether a product should be taken, brought out? 
So I bring those, that's characteristic of the firm. Uh, so everything has been put to this kind of thing. And of course, because it's based on science and data, they look at gazillions amount of data every day in, in this thing. So they have always been very highly involved in using technology and finance science. So I guess you could say they've been doing FinTech for 38 years. Well, should I do the calling or somebody else? Did I lose my caller? All right, well, you were so nice to be a, a piece of my, all of you who served to help me in my lecture, thank you, but go ahead. Uh, my pleasure. Um, you know, I thought the way that you explained index fund and no trust system was so intuitive. And, uh, but I uh, had one question. Do you actually think this no trust system can continue when the uh, market actually started downturn? When uh, actually index funds started losing money and retail investors take care about trust system or no trust system? Absolutely, and I think the reason why is nobody likes to lose money. In fact, one of the things I didn't put up there, the difference between crisis and losing a lot of money, they're not the same. Crisis always involves losing a lot of money. If you don't lose a lot of money, it's hard to have a crisis. But every time you lose a large amount of money, it doesn't mean it's a crisis. The difference of the two is, first, let's be clear. Losing a lot of money, no one likes. OK? So let's stipulate that. There's no way to get around that. But there's a difference between losing money, knowing that you could have beforehand, that you took a risk, it was a real risk, and unfortunately the risk was realized, you're unhappy with the outcome, but you have no reason to change what you're doing going forward. You keep doing the same thing. Why? You made the right decision, it just didn't come out. Risk is real. If you say, I can always forecast and it always happens, then you don't have any risk. So that's, that's not a crisis. Let me give you an example that may help you to understand the difference. How many people have had the flu? Do you know what the flu is? I've had the flu, you know? Well, I don't know about you, when I've had the flu, I feel terrible. My head is pounding, I can barely breathe. In fact, I would say I feel like I'm almost dying. But what do I know? I've had the flu before, I've been through the flu before, and in three days, maybe a week, I'd probably be okay. Now, don't understand, I'm not happy. Boom, 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 right? Now, rewind the story. Same symptoms, no worse. Heads pounding, hard to breathe, feel like you're dying. And your doctor says, I'm sorry, I don't know what's wrong with you. Is that the same situation? No. Now you're really. And yet, objectively, the symptoms are identical. But how it impacts you is very different. The second one is what I mean by crisis. You've lost trust in your understanding of the system. You've, you no longer feel that you have, I understand what's going on here. I don't like it, but I understand it. That's the first case. The second case is, I don't like what's going on, and I don't understand it. I've lost trust in my understanding, because I don't know what's causing it. I don't know any better way to try to get you to understand the distinction. The second one is when panic happens. That's when you have crisis. That's when people bolt. They don't bolt just because things go down. Now, as an empirical matter, we've been indexing now for nearly half century. And markets have gone down and up and down, and that's some of the most stable money because they believe, have trust in, or believe in that this is the right you know, strategy. If something caused them to lose that belief, then I agree with you. But the whole idea here is that you're saying, you know, markets work, um, and you're taking risk, so don't be surprised if it goes down. Don't like it. Why do you do it? Because it might go up. And if it goes up, I'm going to get things I couldn't get without taking risk. You see the difference? So there's nothing there. I think that actually indexing is very stable. But I would add a footnote just for those of you. Everybody accepts indexing, you know, trillions of dollars of it as a normal, prudent thing. I can tell you what it was like. Now try to think of this. Imagine before there was indexing, going to the prudent person committee. That's the august committee who says, 
whether advisors or trust departments are doing prudent things for their clients. They're very, very stern. And, yeah. and walk into the room and say, we have an idea of something that would be great for people, very prudent. We want you to say this is prudent. We want to buy 500 stocks, and we don't even know what they do. We've never looked at their balance sheet, and we have no idea whether they might go bankrupt or whether they're earning lots of money or anything else. Think for a minute. How do you think that that looked? They looked at us like, are you out of your freaking mind? You mean you think it's prudent not to even know what the company does? In some cases, you don't even know where it's located, except maybe it's a US company? I only want you to kind of jog your mind. Today, no one questions that. But it was a tough job to get it done. So it takes you to create that kind of trust for the regulators this time, it takes a lot of work. But once you've created it, if you've done a good job at it, it's pretty stable. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, I have a question regarding the, the graph you showed about basically the money flow into index fund, but flow away from the uh, active. active funds. So uh, I was actually thinking about basically how these two funds operate. The first one basically just replicate whatever index there is mechanical. This doesn't involve any uh, fundamental research. But for many of the uh, active funds, largely they still actually do fundamental research in terms of cash flow and the business model, et cetera. So when the money flow from the active funds into the index funds, is there any concern that the entire uh, financial market Very be becomes point. less efficient? Because basically now nobody is doing fundamental research but focus on just replicating whatever is there in the market. So the question is, is this can be regarded as a price of losing the trust in the market? And uh, if this argument is right, then actually flying into the indexing, is, is, is this the solution to actually uh, solving the problem of the trust? To me, yeah. it's very likely that the solution should be still rebuilt and strengthen the trust and encourage people to go back to the active okay. funds. So that's I that's a like very good question. Your, uh, I, I, everybody so, understand the question? <laughs> OK? Uh, no, I just want to make sure. Okay, okay. okay. No, it's a very good question. And I'll give you ways to think about the answer. Like most things, there may be more than one answer. You, you say the possibilities are, well, look, if money flows out of active money and goes into passive money, then maybe there's not as much information in prices and they won't be as good. But do the analysis. Actually go and, and look at it. And what will you discover? Thank you. I think she's telling me something. <laughs> Is that better? Oops, I, OK. Let me tell you to think about this. There are people in the market who do active investing who have real information, meaning they, they uncover things, they act on it, because if they don't act on it, it won't affect prices. They act on it, and as a result, they influence prices and bring that information in. That's the informed trader. What do passive traders do? They do whatever the market is. So what is their impact? They just amplify the active traders. Do you understand? Because whatever you active traders are influencing prices by your behavior, we just mirror you. So what we do, if there's more of us, is we amplify the actives. You see why? I mean, if, if it was half active and half passive, we amplified by two. two. If it's one quarter active, three quarter passive, we amplify by three. Do you, do you see what I'm, I'm saying? Okay. So we amplify. Now, there are a whole bunch of other people in the market, which we sometimes call noise traders. These are people who act like they have information. They do analyses and so on. But actually, their information isn't any of use. In fact, it's, it could be behaviorally wacko. It could be just data that's already been used. It can be wrong. You know, We call them noise traders because they don't act like passive. Passives, like my sister, who's the smartest one in my family, she knows that she doesn't know anything about finance, so she's just passive. But then there were other people who think they know something, lots of times economics professors, who think that they can forecast markets. And they're very smart, but they're competing with people 
who have a lot of economists working for them and have a lot of other resources, and maybe they're not smarter than the ones who they're competing with. Those people act like that. They influence prices because they're acting like they have information, and the market really can't tell whether when you act like an informed trader that you really are or whether you're not. So the market, if I'm a market maker, you act like an informed trader, I'm going to adjust prices against you. So you influence prices, but you're adding no value. In fact, you're adding noise to the system because you're acting like you know something when you really don't. Now, my question to you is, in this exit, that we saw, and okay, who do you think excess is first? The people who are the you know, well, best informed with the best models or doing the best, or those who thought they were and have discovered may maybe not, that's one. Number two, I'm describing retail investors here. Remember I showed you retail? And if you look at the institutional investors, their behavior has not been particularly do is they've moved to things like factor investing and so forth. That's just a different set of strategies. But they haven't just gone to passive in this way. Who do you think is probably bringing more information into the market? The financial institutions with trillions of dollars and huge resources can hire anyone, any models, any managers they want, or people who on weekends in between doing basketball and preparing their lectures for Monday morning do their analysis on their books. I'm asking, this is a question, not for an answer. for me? Oh. Sure. No. Oh, okay. No, but I'm, I'm this oh, okay. is rhetorical. I'm not <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to look for an answer because oh, okay. we'll turn this into a seminar, which okay. is fine with me, but probably not with the audience <laughs> and my, and my uh, the people who invited me here. But I wanted to tell you how to think to answer your question. I'm saying that if you get noise traders out, actually the passive traders will then amplify the better information and you can get more informed. That's the first statement. The second statement, there's a famous paradox, or infamous paradox, this Grossman Stiglitz to say just what you said. If everybody believed in passive, there'd be no one looking at value, prices could be anything. That seems like a paradox. But I can solve that paradox very simply. There are people who want to know about a company because they're their competitor, their customer, okay, or their supplier. So even if you're not going to invest, you've got to find out information about the company. Once you have that information, the marginal cost of using that information for trading is zero. So I can show you there's a bunch of people out there that have zero marginal cost for information. Therefore, that paradox goes away. I don't want to turn this into this. I'm saying to you, now it just becomes a question of quantification or not. I'm just pointing out to you that the world over the last 30, 40, or 50 years has become very institutional. Very few individuals buy individual stocks anymore. They tend to trade in pools. An overwhelming volume of trading is done by institutions. It's an institutional market. So prices are probably not being set by college professors, taxi drivers, and ribbon clerks. That's a model of another thing. Yeah, this could be small markets around in some places that way. We know that, to some of the stuff. But not for the general markets. And secondly, I remind you, it's a global market. I started with that today. So you're competing. Norges Bank, the petroleum fund of Norway with over a trillion dollars and lots of resources, invests in Asian markets. They invest in all the markets, just as the big Asian institutions invest in all the markets. So you have a global competition for all of this stuff. So that's the context you got to think. Don't think of this as a bunch of you know, people like college professors like me who are setting the prices of the securities markets or the bond markets. I don't think that's a good model. But that's my opinion. I think I've gone on a lot. But you get, now you work on it and you write a paper about it. <laughs> Oops, something. Oh, all right, I hope I didn't kill anything. This is Rest Pearson. Who? All right, somebody. Maybe we can have two. And then okay. We uh, first, for, uh, first, thank you for your great rest chair. And uh, I will ask you a question. Well, I think Google doesn't uh, Google doesn't open to public what algorithm they use for searching, and also investment banks such as uh, actual funds doesn't open to public what algorithm or models they use. Uh, but we trust Google because they give us some useful informations, and also we don't trust actual funds because 
uh, they don't give us useful information or find profit. Then in this case, isn't trust better uh, of verification, not the matter of trustworthy? So in my opinion, I don't be, uh, people don't believe actual funds just because they don't make enough funds. In You're saying that trustworthiness, Google's trustworthy anyway. Uh, uh, the well, look. That's not contradicting what I've said to you. Let's be clear. Thank you for your question so I can be clear. I did not say that Google couldn't end up in the business if it can figure out a way to get itself trusted for the purposes of managing money when it can't be transparent and when it can't be verified. I didn't say that was impossible. I mean, they could become a bank. Maybe. And maybe they get regulated. That would be one way to get more trust for Google. I don't care how it happens, because I don't know. But it has to happen. I'm saying the model that has been put out there by the tech people, I call them that only because they really aren't thinking about finance. They're saying that, that, that their world is tech. And they're fantastic. Don't misunderstand me. I mean, they're tremendous. They make an assumption that that's not a problem. And I'm saying to you, maybe it is. Maybe it's going to be harder for the Googles to be able to enter into that space. It's certainly been hard for the institutions that are there to prove to one another who's, who to trust. But I think I got to you that trust is a big issue. So if Google can find a way to do it, and the thing I will say to you is they may try to be transparent. Maybe they show algorithms. Maybe they show you more. That's good. Remember I said transparency is a substitution for trust. So if you, more if you can be more transparent, you don't need as much trust. That doesn't mean you don't need trust. Okay? But I'm saying in financial advice, you can't be transparent. It's not a matter of giving even out the algorithm. First of all, no one who, who spends hundreds of millions of dollars developing a proprietary algorithm for trading in the market is going to give that away because that's how they make their living. Okay, people give algorithms away, people have so forth, but they don't give away, that's what's their value. So you're not gonna have that happen anyway for them. But even when you do, all right, you mentioned dimensional, I have, I have to use this because it's a case study very quickly. When you look at what dimensional does, its investment strategies look very simple, and they are probably, I'm not rewarding them for this, I'm stating it as a fact, they're probably the most transparent active manager you'll find out there. They show everything. They explain everything. They tell you exactly what they're doing, and they don't say we have some secret sauce or some secret model hidden in there, OK? Institutions who were their clients to begin with said, gee, this is really simple. Thank you, Dimensional. We don't need you anymore. We can do it. After all, we're an institution. They tried doing it. And what happened? They didn't do well. What did that prove? It obviously wasn't transparent. Because if it was transparent, then you fully understood the institution could have replicated. They couldn't. I'm saying it's much harder to replicate these things. I didn't say you can't get trust. Always. I didn't say you can't get transparency. Always. I'm saying that won't solve it. That's my claim. I'm happy to have if we can do it otherwise. I, think, I hope that is addressing your, your question. One, one more or no? Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.